Well, good morning, Renovation Church, and uh, again, happy Father's Day. I'm going to read a passage of scripture here that we have read often over these last few months, and uh, just remind us today, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, and literally what that means right there, watchful, is to stay awake, be vigilant, be responsible, be watchful, and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, being here today without all that were here last week plus some, it's kind of like being on a diet where you have to portion control. <laughs> you know where they go, okay, you get this much and it's really good. And they go, you can't have any more. And, and so here we are. We have said from day one, and I know you feel like, some may feel like we've kind of been up and down, inconsistent. I don't feel that way. We've been consistent in what we've said from day one. We want to be part of the solution. We want to be a part that the people would look and say that the, that the church, this local church, I can't decide, as I've said from day one, what other churches do. I'm not going to try to do that. Like I said, we we're speaking on today on Father's Day. I just try to be a father in the house that I'm in and try to lead them. I don't try to do it somewhere else. And so that's what we're trying to do right now, to be watchful and prayerful and just asking the Lord to help us kind of navigate this season. So, of course, we've come to a pause. I would ask you to do this for us during this time. And I've caught myself doing this, and maybe you have. I've caught myself putting so much energy into what's right, what's not right. It even gets into political things. It gets into cultural things. And we, we spend a lot of energy and even anxiety over that question when we almost neglect the fact that people are dying, that people are sick. And I'm just going to ask us, and I'm not picking, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to me as much as I am to anybody, that in the middle of all of what we're doing right now, be sure you're spending energy to pray for this, for our culture, pray for our world specifically about this sickness, that God would bring a way, a way maker. He is that, but he'd bring a way for this to cease. But to pray for those who are sick, to pray for those who have lost loved ones. And let's spend some of our energy there. And I'm not saying some of you haven't or you don't spend all of it, but I know I'm talking to me and maybe I'm talking to some of you to spend more energy there right now in prayer. And we're just asking you to trust us and we're going to continue to be watchful and we will keep you posted. Thank you for trusting us and being flexible. And I'm, I do apologize for the inconvenience of the last minute, but we're just doing the best we can. We're trying to get that out. So thank you again. Now, this weekend, we, there's a lot of celebration going on. I know uh, on Friday and Juneteenth, and it was great to see that. But today we come and we celebrate Father's Day, which is exciting for me. You know, one of the parts about Father's Day and, is that, you know, being a father, the tricky part about it is Jan is the only person who's really chosen to spend their life with me. They chose it. My kids didn't. <laughs> And so it kind of, you know, they, they didn't have any choice in that, kind of like I didn't into my family and those kind of things. But one of the things I love about fatherhood, and, and we're going to talk today, this is going to hopefully apply to everybody. The message today will apply to everybody. But one of the things I love about fatherhood is as being a husband, I don't need to go being multiplying that. I, I don't need to go out and try to be a a good husband to multiple people. That is not what I'm one person that I've dedicated my life to to try to be. But as a father, not only to my four children, but as a pastor and as a leader and as an influencer, I have the opportunity to set the pace and be a father figure to multiple people. And I want to live a life where if that's the need in some person's life, 
that's possible. I know we're limited in that, and I understand all of that, but that's one thing about fatherhood, at least from my vantage point, is that that can multiply. And I know as a youth pastor all these years, and even as a lead pastor, I've had that opportunity to at least step into a gap sometimes, not replacing someone else, but maybe where there was a void to step in. And I'm just thankful for that opportunity. You know, you want to live a life, I hope we all do, and that's really about what the message is about today, because you may be here today, and your experience with your father was not good, or there was no experience, and, and, and I understand that. I was very fortunate to have a father who was awesome and got to know him, you know, 50-something years of my life till he died at, at, at almost 89 years old. Not everybody has that story. And I realize that for some here, uh, you're not fathers are here or are listening online, uh, most of you today, you're not a father at this point or you'll never be because of maybe your gender, obviously, uh, but, but even others may never be a father. This message I hope today, though, is about all of us. And I hope you'll, you'll hang in here with me, even though we are celebrating Father's Day today. But to be a, to be a person who people are wanting to follow or to person that, that say, I will let those people influence me. And you've heard me say multiple times here, I, I will minister to anyone, but I choose my influencers very, very carefully. Because when they influence me, they influence everything in many ways in my life, how, I, how I'm a husband, how I'm a father. So I hope we all, as you may, many of you know, maybe you're just now starting to listen to us online, but our whole, one of our whole goals here is to be influencers for the kingdom, to make an impact for the kingdom. But one of the things in this day and age, the, the term uh, to have a following is kind of taken on a different phrase, as most of us know. I mean, you have Twitter followers, and, and you go, okay, what all does that mean? And I was looking up, uh, the three top Twitter followers are, have the largest following, uh, President Barack Obama, uh, Justin Bieber, Katy, Katy Perry are the top three in the world. And... Uh, you know, and like I said, you look at our culture and go, there are people who have a lot of following, if you will. But you know, when I was in high school, I had a very, most of you know, I came from a very uh, small town in Arkansas and uh, not a very big high school. And, but for some reason, I was in, in many ways the big man on campus for whatever reason. You know, many times when I ask in leadership classes, when I'm teaching on influence, I ask people, when was the first time you knew you were a leader? that you were an influencer, when did it strike you in that moment you go, okay, I can go back to a point in time and realize in that moment I was an influencer. But as I look back on my high school years, I wasn't worth following. I led people to places they, that just were not good influences. Pretty good guy, but that's where I was. Because the fact that people choose to follow you is not necessarily an indicator that you deserve to be followed. Always remember there's a significant difference between having a following and being worth following in any setting. But we want to talk today a little bit about those who are worth following. And it's where I hope today, and some of the stuff you may have heard for, before but from, from me, but I just felt like on Father's Day, in the middle of our culture, in the middle of us looking to leadership to help us, not only in our homes, not only in our communities, what are some things that, at least for me, that I've seen over the years that are of great benefit, especially in the kingdom? And you meet these people, and there's not many. I mean, I, you've heard me talk about some of them before. But their character just seems to be deeper. Their boldness and courage seems greater. Their influence and their concerns just seem broader. They just, they seem to have a bigger picture of all the things that are going on. Their compassion just seems more genuine. It just flows out of who they are. And their convictions, they're more concrete. They know where they're headed. And it just seems like their relationship with God infuses everything about their lives. Their relationship with the Lord makes them stand out in a crowd. 
Jeremiah 17, 7, 8. It said, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Wow. Now, one of the advantages we have here in Arizona, and most of us know if we've been hiking out in the desert, we'll see all these scrub brush, we'll see almost, almost a barren land, and all of a sudden we'll see these green trees, these tall green cottonwoods. And every time we see those, at least I hope you realize, there's life there, there's water there, there's source there. That's what reminds me when I read this passage of Scripture. Even in the barren land, there are these trees that stand out. What would it be like, practically in your life, if you were a fruit-bearing, unwithering tree planted by streams of living water? What is needed for you to do this naturally because of who you are in Christ? Now, I've asked myself and asked students these questions over the years, and adults too, those who've been through the uncommon training. What do you want your spouse to say about you at your funeral? Your children, your friends, your grandchildren maybe. How would you want the people who know you best to describe your life? In other words, what do you want to be? Students who have been a part of our youth ministry over the years know that I, we have put them in situations. Uh, I remember one late night in Arkansas, we woke the students up, put them in the vans at midnight, took them out to our graveyard about four or five miles out on a dirt road and uh, in the countryside of Arkansas. And they stepped out and took their flashlights and they walked around and read the epitaph on the graves. Another time we took the students out to Greenwood Cemetery just out on the west side of 17 out here and I had the students sit out there for a couple of hours and write their own obituary. And probably for some of you right now going, thank goodness I was never in your youth ministry or my kids were not in your youth ministry. <laughs> but the point of it is, what do I want them to say about me there? Let's start it now. Let's start thinking about it today. What I want them to say about me down the road. So what would we say? I'm going to give you five things here today. I'm usually not a point guy necessarily. I just kind of ramble most of the time. <laughs> I hope that's not the right. But I, kind of, but, I, but I hope today to maybe give you some thoughts. Like I said, some of you have heard this from me before. But hopefully it will just be a reminder here on Father's Day, but for all of us right now, to be influencers in our community, not fighting, not trying to, but figuring out how do we make this go? How do we, make, how do we be part of the solution as part of the church, being part of the solution in our communities and around the world, but starting in our homes? and those who are closest relationships to us. So here's a few things. One is, around people that I have met in my life, one is Christ is central to everything they do verbally and non-verbally. And what I mean is, not only what comes out of their mouth, but their actions. Ethos, and many of you know this as we've used it over the years. It's a spontaneous reoccurring pattern that is the fundamental character spirit that defines a person or a group. It's what drives them. It is the underlying conviction that determines the beliefs, values, and worldview of a person and or a community. It has the capacity to influence and shape everything in their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, what makes us contagious. The fire in the belly where you become the fragrance and aroma for the kingdom. An ethos, it just permeates out of your life. It can happen in a church, it can happen in individuals. One of the things, and I, and I 
send us an email on Friday. And again, I apologize if for some reason a miscommunication, some of you may not have gotten the email that we had changed back to media online only. But one of the things I said, and I mean it, the church is never closed. The church is not a building. It is where influence for the kingdom choose to be salt and light where they're engaged and influential. My challenge to you right now as we are in this season, ask yourself, write it down, where am I engaged and influential? And advance the kingdom there. Again, we got a little taste the last few weeks of what we've been missing. But the reality is, no matter when we come back together or matter where we are right now, we are supposed to be influenced where we're engaged and influential. influential in, yeah, whatever I was trying to say there. See, people who get this, they know the real person, the real purpose of the church. The real purpose of the church, as much as we love it, is not about nice buildings. And it's not about all the cool lights, and we have those. It's not about all the great technology, even online streaming and all the things. It, it is, even though those are great add-ons, they're great uh, essential, they're not essential. The essential is, is what Jesus came for. He came to seek and save those who were lost. And he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. He did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. The very central, and, and the reality is, I believe, people who get it, they can't help but tell as Peter and John says, we can't help but tell about what we've seen and heard. When Jesus is the central point of your life, you can't help verbally and non-verbally to want people to know about what you've gotten in on. It's central to your life. All decisions filter through it the best you know how. And my encouragement here, let me say this real quick, and I know we got to keep rolling here, is be with a community of people who keep you accountable to that. Who ask you a question, how, have you, how does that fit through what Christ is doing in the world and what he wants to do? Second thing I would say, and again, I know I'm giving them numbers here, but that's okay. You can write them. This is a long one. I tried to hone it down, but Eva, here we go. They have a great story, and they know how to tell it, but they value others by asking them about their story. You want to get into a person's life, ask them about themselves. We so often, and that's the one thing that's a challenge sometimes as believers, is that we want to tell our story. This is what God, and that's good. You need to know how to tell that. But often you need to hear someone else's story first. You need to have your head up, as we say often, your head up in the eyes of Christ and asking him to give you eyes to see what you would never, not necessarily see, to be watchful and prayerful and thankful for those inconveniences that seem like inconveniences that you find out later were opportunities. Be thankful. And I know the other day, and I, know, I think we may have that quote up there uh, uh, from T.D. Jakes, as I quoted you last week, because this is how it feels sometimes, right? About We talked about in the new wine last week, uh, T.D. Jakes. You want to ask this question, is God burying me or is he planting me? <laughs> how many of you used that thought this week? God is not burying me. He is planting me. He's doing, he's up to something. But sometimes we have to be reminded, don't we? That what God has just given me was an opportunity. And be thankful. Do you look into the faces, especially now with masks, and, and we're wearing masks in here, just those who should be uh, wearing masks in here. We're trying to do what you guys are doing, and we're staying the distance, and, and we're trying to stay it up here as best we know how, even when there's only a few of us in here. But it is hard sometimes when you only see someone's eyes. And that's all you see. But look, anyway, be watchful, pay attention. I think one of the signs of spiritual maturity is you pay attention. Because see, the word pay means it costs you something. I 
I think another part of this here too is we look into the other and we, we, we try to see the best. No matter what you're seeing on TV, don't try to look for the worst, try to look for the best. We believe people can, we believe God can change anyone's life to set them free to live a life that is abundant, as, as Jesus said, the reason why he came. We believe it's for anybody. Years ago, we took students on one of our trips, and again, we took them to my brother-in-law's chicken house in Arkansas. And back then, one of the things they did with catching chickens was uh, they used a vacuum, a big, huge vacuum cleaner. It was crazy to watch. They were just sucking those chickens up and shooting them into a cage and flipping them around. The kids had never seen anything like 25,000 or so chickens in this house, and they're catching these chickens, and they're firing them into these cages, and they're... But one of the things we tried to point out, not just the fact that we tried to traumatize these kids by watching these chickens getting caught. <laughs> but so those chicken catchers are as important as you are. How do you treat people you can gain nothing from? How do you treat people that there is not one thing they can give you? Because you're looking for a way to give yourself away. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Asking that chicken catcher their story. And one reason they're so important, you wouldn't get your grilled chicken sandwich at Chick-fil-A if they weren't working. All joking aside, we need each other. We need to know our stories. Know your story, but we need to know others. Their credibility and influence. Number three, their credibility or influence comes from the longevity of a consistent life. Their credibility or influence how many of us want to have influence right now? But we've not lived the life that gives us that. We've not lived a consistency. We want to have it now. We want to sw not, not sway people for their bad, but for their good. To know Christ and to, to know the, the freedom that can come by giving our life to Christ and freeing us from sin and freeing us from the baggage that we've had in our past, that we're no longer paralyzed by what's happened, what's happened to us or what we've done. But it comes from being credible. I love what Jim Collins says. The sign of mediocrity is not the unwillingness to change, but the signature of mediocrity is chronic inconsistency. And I know for some of you, you might look at us changing over the last, these last few days and go, well, that's inconsistency. No, it's consistent on what we said from day one of why we, why we did no gathering initially. It's for the good of others, and we have not changed that. And we're trying to represent the kingdom the best we can in that. But in your life, are you leaning into what you believe God has shown you to become? For instance... No doubt over a series of, uh, over your life, you do need to gain knowledge. You need, to, you need to know more about what you're talking about. No question about that. But the truth is, and let me tell you this, if you want to be an influencer for the kingdom, as a father, as a mother, as any individual, young adult, wherever you are, if you want to be a great influencer, especially for the kingdom, those who choose to follow you will expect more from you when it comes to consistency and character than they will ever expect from themselves. Get used to it. I'm not saying that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm just saying that's the way it is. But boy, if you can figure out a community where it says, no, I want to be held to the standard you're held to. I want to be held to the consistency of life that you're held to. Man, beautiful things happen. Not out of legalism. Legalism leads to bondage. 
Discipline leads to freedom. Because influencers who are worth following don't pretend to live in two worlds. You see them here or you see them there, they're the same people. But here's the deal. Somewhere between you and your goal of being a great influencer, there's a minefield <laughs> for you to get tripped up. Yeah, it's much easier to listen to an off-color joke that you should not be listening to or laugh at it because you're nervous and you don't want to say anything. It's just easier. It's just easier to go out and mow the yard instead, or, 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 or watch TV than talk to your spouse or your kids or, or as, a as, a, as a child, talk to your parents about real issues in life. It's just easier. It's much easier to plan your next golf trip or organize your room than it is to organize your life for a great purpose. It's much easier to be a consumer or spectator that constantly receives and withdraws than an investor. It's just easier. It's just easier to check your social media and get consumed by what's on TV or on, on the news or your social media than it is to be in the Word with God every day. It's just easier. It's loaded with minefields. It just is. As you will discover, if you haven't already, the shortest distance between where you are and where you want to be is not always the most honorable one. Doing what's right will cost you. It will cost you your time. It may even cost you friends, and it may cost you opportunity, but it's always the right thing to do the right thing. And the right thing is what lines up with God's righteousness. The scary part about all I'm talking to you about here this morning is, is that your talent and your giftedness and your drive and your personality has the potential to take you farther than your character, character can sustain you. That reality ought to scare you to death and put you on your knees before the Lord. Is it my talent and my personality and my drive and my dreams can take me further than the character that I have inside of me can sustain me or back me up. But let me tell you this, this, once you've determined what you want to be, tell somebody. Go public with your intentions. If you've got a friend group, if you're young adults and, and uh, uh, you know, if, 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 whatever, agree a friend group, why don't you just all go sit down and go, what's my intention? What am I trying to become? Not what job do I want next? Not what no, what am I trying to become? What am I trying to be? Not what, I, what am I trying to do, what am I trying to be? Because God's more concerned about who you're going to be than what you're going to do. Because if you figure out who you're going to be, what you're going to do, it's gonna, you're going to take that everywhere. No matter what you do. And I know you would say, is it really anybody else's business? What I, you bet it is. Because let me give you a little secret. Everybody who knows you has an opinion about the kind of person you are. That's not breaking news. They already have an opinion. You might as well let them know the kind of person you want to become. The definition of success, I heard years ago, I think it was John Maxwell says, for those who, my, my intention is, my definition of success is this, for those who know me best to love and respect me the most. Those who watch me every day, those who watch me, those are the people. I know there's going to be people out there, I, you know, emails or phone calls or whatever, or opinions. They may have an opinion of me, but what I want to know is those people who know me most, what do they think of me? Because they see me everywhere. I know I'm getting fired up this morning in so many ways. This is my passion. There's a couple things that are passionate in my life besides being hopefully a good husband. Fatherhood is one of them. And being a great influencer is another one. And 
I want to help people get there. By no means am I living into all this, but that's my goal. I'm trying. This is a standard that I may not ever attain fully, but I'm trying. The next one is, they do not allow the past to steal their future, but instead they use it to help motivate their future. They do not allow, if I had allowed my past to steal, I would have never had the opportunity not only to raise my kids the way I have and be married to Jan and to travel and all we've done, but to influence literally hundreds of teenagers over my lifetime. I hope for the good, I think it was. <laughs> I would have let it, it would have gotten stolen because the baggage that I was carrying would not have allowed me to walk into the future. I allowed that baggage to motivate me for the future. Heard this years ago. Is take your baggage from the past and slap the devil with it. No, nah, you ain't doing that no more. I heard what Jesus said. He, Jesus said, you came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm going to take what you, 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 either it happened to you or you did it. Either way, I'm going to take that, and it's going to be something that I'm going to use when I need to. But just give it to me, and I'm going to give you a life that's full of abundance. And I love what Maria Robinson says. Nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. And the last one is this. There is an urgency to their lives. There is an urgency to their lives. They know daylight's burning. If the last few months have not said this to you, there is an urgency. I'm not sure what else will. To, part of it is to say, We've had time to think through things. There's things we need to work through. There's things we need to be a part of solution in our culture. There's no question about that. Are we listening? Are we educating ourselves? Are we looking? Are we opening our hearts up? Are we... Jesus told the disciples, you say four months till the harvest. I say the harvest is now. They understood, and he was trying to say, the stakes are too high for us to, to, us to wait till some other day. To play some kind of silly game at church or silly game in our culture. Silly ga- no, there's too much at stake here. There's people's lives that need to know about this freedom. That comes only, not because of Renovation Church, not because of who we, what part of the denomination. It's because of the one that we serve, Jesus Christ. They need to be pointed to him. I love what Dallas Willard says, talking about many times we go, well, I'll wait till I get this right in my life. I'll wait till COVID-19 gets over. I'll wait till this or that. But I love what he says, God has yet to bless anyone except where they actually are. And if we faithlessly discard situation after situation, moment after moment, as not being right, we will simply have no place to receive his kingdom in our lives. For those situations, moments are life. I know in our culture over the last many decades, fatherhood has been devalued. Let me mention that again. In all kinds of different ways. And many times this father is to blame for much of it at times. Don't have time to work through all that. But I want to say today a couple of things. One is congratulations to those who have become fathers since last Father's Day. Father's Day some even in our community here. This past week, to lose a father and a wonderful man, Dr. Paul Balikian, that has passed away as a father. As a, as a wonderful man who was part of when we were starting here at Renovation. But as much as some of these things, and I, and I even look at my own family, I mean, and I, I, I have, I've been blessed. I've been blessed in this sense is that I had a great father. 
I got two brothers who are great fathers. I got nephews, those who are born into my family, those who, are, who have been married into my family who are great fathers. I just see it all around me in my family. And so for me, sometimes I just go, I think everybody has that. And I know that's not true. But let me say this, even though I think we can value those who just don't have it and don't know how to get there and, and are doing the best they can. And God bless you for raising your children where the father is not there. But can't we do both? Can't we value both at the same time? I'm going to ask Josiah and him to come on down as we close. But last December, Jen and I drove back from Texas. And many of you know her mom passed away just in the last, since this season of COVID. And we've been back to Texas for her memorial and just still miss Betty, obviously, and love her. And, but Jan and I went back in December and brought her dogs out here. And Jan and I were listening to a podcast I think it was Kerry Newhoff interviewing Gordon McDonald, the pastor from, he's, 80, he's in his mid-80s now. And he said as he speaks around the world, he said it's the strangest thing. Often people come up to him and say, you spoke to us like a father. And he says, that's maybe one of my greatest compliments. If somebody says, I'm... And, and they come in droves, and they speak. And I told Jan as we were driving across West Texas or New Mexico, wherever we were, as we were listening, I said, if I can get to my mid-80s or wherever it is, if someone will say about me, that man, the main thing he does in my life is speak to me like a father. One of the things I miss about being in, in ministry and even the mission trips is those 1130 at night conversations with young people. Here I am in my mid-50s, 60 years old. I miss it. I miss it. And I hope someday, you know, as I look at my grandkids, they call me G-Pop. And if we hopefully have more along the way, I hope they continue to call me G-Pop. But I hope to goodness that for generations from now, they're still smelling the fumes of great, 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 great G-pop. <laughs> that I lived a life in such a way that made that kind of difference. I'm not there. I'm trying. But here's what I believe. People in our world don't need to meet 10 people like that that we've talked about today. They need to meet one. My question is, can that one be you? Can it be you? Lord, we come before you today. As we know, you have called us to great things. Even in these tough times, it's already been prayed here, Lord. We've got to believe that you're planning us, not burying us. We've got to believe through this season it's a time to maybe pause, all of us, not just in this room, and we'll see what that means over the weeks and listen and be watchful. But individually, pause. Well, what are you saying? To go public on what we want to be, even though we're not there yet, what we desire to be. Lord, help us. Lord, we know across this valley, even in our own community, those who are even sick now and who in this whole season we're in, they've been affected by that directly. Lord, we pray over them and thank you for them. But Lord, we pray over all that we'll spend our energy praying there and lifting them up as much as we are anywhere else. Lord, you are the way maker. Help us now as we sing it to you in Jesus' name.